trees are magnificent creations. They're beautiful plants. They provide shade. They provide buffer from noise from surrounding streets. Studies have shown that trees in neighborhood tend to bring down violence and they, they, they give a sense of calmness to the neighborhood. Trees provide food uh, for us and for uh, the wildlife. Trees also provide beautiful shades of color when they come out in the spring or when they start to go dormant in the fall. Since most trees are purchased in container pots, we're gonna look at how to select a tree from the nursery. You go to the nursery, there's all these trees, and sometimes we don't really understand what we're buying. We just go and select one, or we say, which one looks good to you? Well, which one does look good? So I have some trees here I'd like to show you. Here's some things to look for. First, let's look at the pad. This is a bur oak tree, and it's really not very large. At its height, it can be 70 feet tall. So you go to the nursery and you look at this little thing here, it's 24 inches tall, and you think, well, I could, 24 inches, I could buy two or three of those things. This will grow to be 70 feet tall. The acorns are massive acorns, so it'd be helpful to do a little bit of research first. Can your yard sustain a huge tree? A medium-sized tree needs a thousand square feet to grow healthy. That's about 33 by 33 and three feet deep. And most yards are not much bigger than that. So this tree, this bur oak would probably be on the larger side. It's gonna definitely shade out any possibility of growing turf grass or anything that needs full sun if you have a traditional uh, residential size lot. But let's take a look at this, this, uh, this bur oak. Here is the challenge in this bur oak. Trees like to have one trunk that goes all the way to the top and all the other branches sort of subservient or subdominant. This one has a split right here. First off, this is an inherently weak area. And if this tree gets to be 70 feet tall and both of these are still part of the tree, the top of this 70 foot tree is gonna be inherently weak because it has this Y right here. So, First off, what would I do? I would, I would look for another tree. This is not the tree I would select. If I had to, I would select one of these two branches to be the dominant branch, and I'd remove the other one. So if I wanted to keep this one, I would cut this one off and let this one grow. In time, it, will, it looks awkward now. In time, it will straighten out, and the tree will have one steady trunk all the way to the top. But this is a problem that we, if you see this on a container tree, look for another tree. Now this bur oak has that one trunk, which is good. But the problem is looking into the roots, look into the pot. As we look into the pot, we see this is a girdling root. What a girdling root does in time, it will, it will surround the trunk. It'll cut off the vascular system. It's like putting a tourniquet on your leg or on your arm and leaving it there. It's going to create some damage because it's interrupting the blood flow. The same thing is true here. This girdling root will in time circle this tree. It'll cut into the tree bark, cut into the trunk, and it'll cut into the vascular system, which will affect the growth of this tree. I've seen trees where the, the girdling roots, it was planted with girdling roots, and the roots continued to swirl around or circle around in the hole. And seven years later, the tree still was not established. It was still rocking back and forth because the roots didn't spread out. They continued to circle. So if you come across a tree like this, if you have to buy it, you start cutting these roots. Pull, pull the tree out of the pot and cut these roots and make the tree start spreading out. But the best thing, go find another tree. I'm doing a landscaping job just up the street here, and I chose this lacy oak. Why this lacy oak? Well, looking in here, there's no circling roots. That's a good start. Look, start at the bottom before you go to the top. If it has a bad root system, the top doesn't make any difference. As I look at it, it seems to have a good, healthy root structure, and I like that. What I'll do is I'll get rid of, I'll, I'll shake a lot of this off before I plant it. As I go up the stem, it has a good separation here of branches. This might be a problem in the future with these two against each other, but I'll worry about that in about seven, eight, nine years. 
here it has one continuous trunk all the way to the top. Now here is a, it could be a challenge. There's three branches here or three, three splits from the trunk and that could be a problem. I can't let all three of these grow because they're going to compete for dominance. This, I have this one, this one, and this one. I'm not sure how the camera shows it, but this one is really the tallest. So I'll let this grow for uh, two or three years. Let all, uh, The reason you don't want to trim it at the beginning is because as this tree gets planted, it's going to go in some sort of shock and it needs to photosynthesize, get as much energy as possible. So I'm going to leave as much leaves on here as I possibly can and as many limbs as I can. So when I first plant it, I'll leave it alone. Three to five years down the road, what I will do is I will come in and I will remove this one and I'll remove this one, and then this will be the dominant stem coming up from the trunk. So the trunk will go from here, all the way up to here, and up through this one. I have to keep an eye on this one because it may want to compete to be dominant. I can't let that happen, but right now, this will be planted as it is, three to five years. These two will be removed, and this will be uh, the dominant uh, part of the tree that continues to grow. So when you're selecting your tree, take your time. Look at the root system first. How does it look in the pot? Pull it out of the pot. Take a look at it. Might make the nursery people nervous, but see what's in there because you're going to plant this in your yard and it may be for, for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You may be planting it for the next generation. And to have a healthy tree, you need a healthy root system. So take time to look at the roots. Here's a chinkapin oak that I was looking at. It's in a one gallon pot. Unfortunately, a lot of the soil has settled around it, which is kind of concerning for me because it affects the way the root growth is going and the, the way the root flare is being developed. But as I look down here, here are more girdling roots. See those roots right there? As this tree matures in size, these roots are going to mature in size and they are going to cut into the bark here. And again, just like in the other example, this is going to affect the health of this tree. The tree may live. Uh, in fact, it probably will live, but it's not going to be as healthy as it possibly can. And a few years down the road, there may some, be some significant structural issues. You'll need to call in an arborist to take care of when really you could have taken care of at the beginning. If you had to, if you, if you have an opportunity, pick another tree at the nursery. If you have to buy this one because you like the structure or whatever it is, go in, dig this out, see what kind of a root system you have, but cut these things so that the girdling doesn't take place. At the landscape job I'm doing, I want a variety of trees. They have a lot of oak trees across the street, but this on the other side of the street. And I want to see how many varieties of trees I can get. So I'm going to have a, a Mexican sycamore. I have a Mexican plum because it's just the beauty of those trees. But I'm also going to put up a Shantung maple. If you look on the CPS suggestions, Shantung maple is not there. But if you go to the Texas Superstar website, the Shantung maple is a Texas superstar. And that's a separate story, which I'll get to some other time. But I selected this tree. This is a great tree to, to put in this place that's really I'm making a park. One thing, I don't like this stick on here. I know the nursery put them on there. They want to keep them nice and straight, give them some support, but they create problems. So this is going to come off. I've seen examples where on these trees, the tape it was put on there when the tree was younger and the tree was starting to grow around the tape. And the challenge is that tape was interfering with the vascular system, which was interfering with the growth of the tree. So these things, the nursery put them on there. They put them on there for a reason. But when you buy them, the first thing is take these things off. All right. The, the stake is gone. The label has gone. Look at the beautiful structure of this tree. A single trunk coming up leading to a single trunk, leading to a single trunk. This is what we want in the shape of a tree. As I look at the tree then, I see a nice 
Look at how nicely the branches balance off against each other. There's no weird kind of growth in there. But look at this beautiful spacing here, spacing here. In future, maybe this will become an issue because it's close to this. But for the next three to five years, let it grow because the tree needs as much sunlight as it can to photosynthesize to get the energy to grow to develop that root system. In a few years down the road, let's see what this looks like. This might need to come up. In the meantime, let's, we're going to leave it alone. This is an issue, but not again, not for three to five years. This is just things you look for as you purchase trees. Let me turn this around for you. This I may cut off now. Why? Because this limb is going to rub against this limb and where they rub is going to create a wound. And so as this limb gets larger, rubs against this limb, there could be a problem. So the rule that normally you don't, you don't trim these young trees, this might be an exception because I don't want this interfering or, or affecting the growth of this. But I'll think about that. I'll plant it and I'll check on it from time to time, maybe in another year or so I'll take a look at it. But right now, there are no serious structural problems to the top of this tree. So this pretty soon is going to go in the ground and it's going to start having a magnificent life. As I look at the root system, I don't see any circling roots. I see a decent root flare. It's pretty well potted. When I pulled it out of the nursery, it looked good. Let's take a look at it now. I don't see any circling roots in here. I see a pretty nice healthy root system. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break some of this off, shave it off before I put it into the ground and uh, plant it. When you plant trees, the depth of this is probably going to be right about here you want this flare this root flare sticking slightly above the ground because it's going to settle you don't plant trees deep because you're planting in a bowl and they'll drown but what i'll also do is as wide as this is this hole that i'm going to dig is going to go out at least twice as much so this is where i'm planting those trees this is basically a bare area and I thought, let's put some trees here and start to make it a park setting. So I measured very carefully. It's about 85 feet back, up to around 50 feet wide. I mapped it out on a piece of graph paper and I very carefully uh, figured out where, how large the trees would be to sort of get an idea of what it looked like. And I'm gonna take you through the process that I use when I go to plant trees. Now the sort of the anchor of this park, soon to be park, is going to be the uh, Mexican sycamore, which is going to go straight back over there. And it's going to shade that area from the west sun that comes in from the south, goes over this way here. That Mexican sycamore grows 60 feet tall, 30 feet wide. So it's going to get really a great, uh, a great shade for that area. Mm -hmm. But that Mexican sycamore is going to anchor this park area. Then over here to my right that I'll show you a little later is going to be a Mexican plum which has beautiful white blooms in the, uh, in the in spring. Straight back here will be a Shantung maple, which is a Texas superstar. It's gonna give beautiful color in the fall. And then right in this area is gonna be a Basham's Party Pink Crepe Myrtle. Again, a Texas superstar. So I'm using two Texas superstar plants. It's gonna be just beautiful. So the trees are layered. The, the shorter trees of 20 feet or so are gonna be in front. And then the taller sycamore tree will be in the back. So you have this sort of slope look. When you come to the area in the spring, you're gonna see this beautiful white Mexican plum. And you're gonna see then in the spring and summer going to the fall, you're gonna see this beautiful Basham's party pink. And then in the fall, you'll see the colors, hopefully depending on the weather, you see the beautiful uh, turning of the leaf colors, uh, the Shantung maple anchoring in the back will be that Mexican sycamore. The beautiful thing about the Mexican sycamore thing is two things, as I said earlier. One is the bark, beautiful bark. And then the second thing is the leaves. Underneath that silver, on top it's green. When they flutter in the breeze, you're gonna have that wonderful color as you look at this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna first set the, the parameters for that Mexican sycamore. I know the, the canopy is about 30 feet wide. So I'm gonna put a stake in the ground and I'm gonna measure out 30 feet and make a circle so that I know that's the width of that canopy. 
And so I need to make sure I measure them very carefully so the, the trees don't run into each other, which is a real problem we see in, in uh, subdivisions where they just plant these trees so close and they're rubbing up against each other and it creates problems. So here's the area. Mexican sycamore, Mexican plum, Shantung maple, Basham's party pink. Time to get to work. So here's the Mexican sycamore. It's going to be planted right about that area, 17 feet about 17 feet, 17 feet back over there around that Mexican honeysuckle. 17 feet takes us right over that area there. So this gives the Mexican sycamore plenty of room to grow, no competition, nobody's gonna borrow the branches. So here is where the Mexican sycamore is growing. That hole is more than three times the size of that pot from the tree to the outskirts of the hole is about 36 inches. You want a wide hole. You do not want a deep hole. So the first thing I'm going to need to do is remove these ties, get rid of the stake, and dig that hole just where the root flare is slightly elevated above the ground. All right, this is just about perfect. The root flare is slightly above the hole. The idea is this is going to settle in time and if you plant it too low it becomes like a bowl and you start drowning the root the roots excuse me. you start drowning the roots so you want the root flare slightly elevated above the hole and then fill in with the soil best back soil don't buy special soil don't fill it fill it full of compost that is not helpful for the roots these roots need to learn how to grow in this soil so what I'm going to do is I'm going to backfill all of this and then I'm going to go around and make sure this soil is very, very loose so that the roots, when they start to grow out, they have less resistance. And by the time they get to this firmer ground out here, they'll have some strength. But this is a good depth and this is going to be a beautiful tree. All right, the Mexican sycamore is planted at good depth and for three feet around, that soil is the depth of the tip of that shovel. Good six inches deep, three feet around, no special amendments. What I'm gonna do, I made a slight berm here. I'm gonna fill that with water. I'm gonna go work on the next tree and come back and I'll fill that one more time. And then basically I'm through because we, uh, I don't want to drown the tree, give it a chance to grow, give it a chance to start maturing in this cool temperatures and I'll keep an eye on it over the months. Here's where the Mexican plum is going to go. As you come out the sanctuary, the first tree you're going to see on the left is going to be this beautiful Mexican plum with magnificent white um, flowers blooming every spring. Here is the beginning of the 20, here it is about to here. So there's about 12 and a half, 13 feet. It's gonna go that way, doesn't make any difference. It's on a hill. It's gonna go over this way, doesn't make a difference. That's gonna be wildflowers. It's gonna go about 12 feet out this way, 13 feet out this way. So this entire area is for this Mexican plum to just grow and thrive and bloom and give beautiful uh, springs of color. That's a good depth for this Mexican plum. Now what I need to do is expand the hole to three times the size of that uh, root ball right there. All right, Mexican plum is dug. The hole's dug and planted. Um, I'll straighten it up just a little bit, but this hole goes out about three times the size it was the container. It's shoveled deep so those roots, once they get established, they can spread out in this soil. Again, don't add compost, don't add special soil. You just need the soil that the tree is going to grow when it has to get used to it. So again, about three times size container, shovel deep, which is maybe six, seven inches deep. I'm not sure how far, but that is one nice hole. This is great soil. This tree is going to give some beautiful color. Maybe this coming spring. Next is the Shantung maple. Beautiful fall color. It's going to, it's going to need a canopy of about 10 feet. So I measured from the Mexican plum that's out 12 feet. That gives it a 25 foot radius canopy. The Shantung maple gets around 20 feet. So I measured about 11 feet from that spike to there. That'll give the Shantung maple plenty of room to grow without these trees growing into each other. But next, 
And here's why you measure. First on a piece of paper, then you come out and measure it in person. I have to make sure that this canopy from this Mexican plum does not interfere with the canopy from this Shantung maple, that they have room to grow, room to breathe. And I need to make sure this Basham party pink is far enough away so that it does not interfere with that Shantung maple's growth. And the Shantung maple does not interfere with this Basham party pink growth. So now I have this sort of triad of color in the fall, in the spring, beautiful white. In the fall, beautiful colors of whatever the beautiful colors of red and yellow. And this Basham party pink, the leaves are beautiful in the fall because they start to turn color. But during the year, it's going to be beautiful pink. In the background, I have my Mexican sycamore. Given the time of year that I wanted this Basham party pink, there were not a lot available. In fact, I only found two. And this was the better of the two. All those circling roots, this has been grown in a container. And all those circling roots, have, they can't stay like that because what will happen is I'm going to plant them in that hole, plant the crepe myrtle in that hole, and those roots are going to continue to go around and round, and they will not branch out. They could possibly suffocate the tree. That tree will never get established in five years from now. It'll still go back and forth. So I'm going to have to shave, uh, shave back on that root ball, cut some of those roots so that the roots are encouraged to spread out. This is what you have to look for when you buy a container tree. And there you have it. A little over an hour and a half later, we have a Mexican plum right over here. Shantung maple, Basham's party pink crepe myrtle, and back there is the Mexican sycamore. If you're wondering where this is located, this is located at Zion Lutheran Church. It used to be called Zion Lutheran Church of Holotus, but now it's just Zion Lutheran Church. And they have, a, there used to be a house here. And they removed the house. It is fascinating to find out how the soils are different. Pretty decent clay soil. In the back, that, that Mexican uh, sycamore had great sandy loam clay soil. Good clay soil right here. This, for whatever reason, around this uh, Shantung maple is more caliche. And I'm going to have to watch that. I may come out here and add some compost in the general, general area around it just to start breaking up that caliche. I did not mix it into the soil. I'll maybe put it on top to help break up that soil. So here it is. And uh, we'll come back and see what it looks like in the spring. If you have a question about this video specifically, uh, please email me. Uh, my email address will be bcmg that's a uh, bear county master gardener it's a private email but i use those initials bcmg61 at yahoo.com and please tell me the specifically the video to which uh, you are referencing if you have uh, gardening questions in general really a great place to start is your uh, county master gardener program and you can find them on the internet this is the contact information for the Bear County Master Gardener Association. Here's our email address. Here is our phone number. It's either a hotline or a helpline, depending on how much of an emergency it is or how bad your crisis is. If it's a, if it's a crisis, it's a hotline. If, uh, if it's not a crisis, you just have general question, it'll consider it a helpline. In Bear County, we also have a Facebook page and you are invited to become part of it. And, and interact on our Facebook page. So I hope this video was helpful and, uh, and I'll see you at the next one.